Protesters have been settled in downtown Kiev in a relatively peaceful gathering since November of last year. But this week, the protests became violent and deadly as clashes between riot police and opposition forces took over. International outcry followed and measures imposed, all while Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych and his political ally, Russia's Vladimir Putin, denounced the protests as extremism supported by the West. Joining us now with his analysis in the nation's capital, Jeff Sahadeo. He is director at Carleton University's Institute of European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies. And Jeff, we welcome you to the broadcast tonight. Uh, we're going to start by showing some uh, rather troubling pictures, uh, images from Ukraine over the last couple of days. Things seemed to move from relatively peaceful to extremely violent in relatively short order. Do you have any thoughts on why that happened so quickly? Well, there are a few different explanations for it. And the first is that Yanukovych, after delays and obfuscations, uh, finally made it fairly clear that he wasn't going to answer some of the protesters' central demands, which were changes to the Constitution. A uh, second explanation has been that recently the protesters have been, you might say, infiltrated or joined by some far-right uh, organizations from Western Ukraine that have been more willing to uh, perpetrate violence than the groups that have been there before. There was a telephone call the other day between Yanukovych and Putin. I know you weren't on the line but I suspect you can imagine what was said. Want to tell us what you think went on on that call? Well, Yanukovych and Putin think the same way and that they neither of them rep really think of these protests as legitimate and think that they must be somehow influenced by foreign outside forces. So I would have to guess that Putin would have told Yanukovych to, to hold the fort to make sure that these protesters uh, do not spread, uh, especially outside of Kiev. So you saw the city of Kiev sort of being shut down, the metro shut down in essence, uh, and that Putin will continue to support the Yanukovych regime. Uh, but they, they're really running out of uh, any solutions that will still allow them to be a legitimate government when the crisis is over. Do you think it might have been something a little more dramatic, such as, fix this damn thing, you're ruining my Olympics? <laughs> well, <laughs> certainly Putin, it's very inconvenient timing for him. Uh, but he doesn't have much more than one line. Uh, he'll say, fix this damn thing, but it's not very clear what there is that can be done. Uh, and there's risks as well for Putin, because if this explodes into civil unrest, then uh, it could not go very uh, badly for him indeed, because it seems that as you see these pictures of snipers killing young medics and these kinds of this bloodshed on the streets of innocent civilians, that really the popular mood, not just in the West, but in all of Ukraine as well, will turn against the government. The Ukrainian government, of course, is saying that it's going both ways, that the protesters have killed, certainly not in the same numbers, but have killed uh, police officers, I think one worker inside a government building, they're saying that's happening too. Do you dispute that? No, I don't dispute that. And, and as I said, there have been uh, signs that uh, there, there are some increasingly violent forces within the protesters themselves. It's a minority. These are groups often associated with the far right uh, in Western Ukraine that have certain very uh, radical nationalist roots, uh, cheering sort of Ukraine for the Ukrainians and uh, really enjoy perpetrating violence. Uh, so that group is there. But at the same time, I think you could make the argument more forcefully that it's really been Yanukovych's failure to uh, meet any demands of the protesters and to try and end these demonstrations that's allowed for this radicalization to take place. Well, the government, in fact, is calling them, quote unquote, American backed terrorists. Uh, yesterday, somebody con compared them to the Brown Revolution, which is a reference, of course, to the Nazis in Germany in the early 1930s. Uh, I appreciate that you've identified a segment of this group that may be interested in violence. But in the main, who do you think the protesters are? Well, at the beginning, these protesters were the people that were really had a very pro-European slant and were very angry that Yanukovych had turned his back on the EU agreement that he was meant to sign in November and then went towards Russia. I think then it's been joined by people who really are just tired of the difficulties of life in everyday Ukraine, the corruption, uh, the unemployment, the economic stagnation, uh, that really want a chance for a new future. And, and a lot of them, when you, when you talk to them on the streets, you, you hear these words that we just want to live in a normal country, in a civilized country. And I think these are really the main groups of, of protesters that are out there. And I, what, I, what seems to have been happening in Kiev just in the last day or two, a lot of people who have stayed off of the streets up till now have joined the protests as well. And, the, and it seems to have spread 
to the point where they're, they've taken large segments of the central, central part of the city. But a more civilized or normal country, as you put it, suggests closer ties to the West, which obviously people in the eastern part, uh, and particularly the Yanukovych government, do not want. Uh, what do those people want? Right. Well, it's interesting because I would say it, the east-west divide will might soften a little bit after this in terms of young people, at least, who do actually want closer ties to the west and, and see eastern Ukraine, which has a very heavy manufacturing base, is very tied to the Russian economy, as quite stagnant. Uh, so certainly the east-west divide exists, and I think people in the east feel much more comfortable. Most of them are, are ethnic Russians or Russian-speaking uh, in that orbit, and they believe that Putin will take care of them. And of course, Putin has carrots uh, as well to offer, particularly in terms of natural gas uh, and various subsidies that it can give the Ukrainian economy. So there is some polarization there that I think will be difficult to overcome. Doug Saunders is a pretty good columnist with the Globe and Mail, and he had this to say just the other day. I want to read a, an excerpt of his column to you and then get you to comment on it. He writes, as police and protesters mounted a final scorched earth battle in central Kiev on Wednesday afternoon and the death toll climbed, an ominous question hovered over the entire region. If this isn't going to be a civil war, then what will it be? Now that President Viktor Yanukovych has turned decisively away from any political compromise or settlement, his options and those of the outside world have become stark and limited. And he clearly has ended any possibility of compromise. On Tuesday night, he ushered leaders of the major opposition parties into his office and told them, apparently with visible anger, that their only option was to clear protesters out of the square. At this point, two options seem most likely, an outright civil war, or a total military crackdown and imprisonment of opposition leaders leading to Belarus-style autocratic rule by Mr. Yanukovych and his party. There are ominous signs that the latter option could be taking shape. Your view on his prognostication. Those are dark scenarios indeed, and, and certainly you can't discard either one of them. I, if I was to be somewhat more optimistic, I might say, and, and I think you've seen just signs of it in the last uh, several hours, in fact, with uh, the <clears throat> leader of the Kiev city administration more or less defecting from the government, and you've seen other defections from the Yanukovych government as well. It's quite possible that the Yanukovych government could just crumble from inside and collapse, uh, opening the door to new elections, which would face the same polarization, but at least you'd have new figures. And you could do things like um, have an amnesty for political prisoners and really rewrite the Constitution to reduce uh, the power of the presidency. So that's, that's option C, I think, which is there, and, and it's, it's just as likely. A lot will depend, after the Olympics, how Putin and the West try and deal with this. Will they also be able to come to some kind of compromise to be able to uh, facilitate a solution? If Putin really realizes that Yanukovych is so uh, stubborn that he might institute a crackdown that would lead, I think, to a, a massive civil conflict. Uh, that's not in Russia's interests. And, and would he actually realize that? And would he go for a more nuanced solution? It's not in his character, but the stakes are incredibly high here. Jeff, I've also read commentary, though, from other analysts who say it hasn't happened yet. I mean, there's more than 100 dead, and that's awfully tragic. Uh, but they have suggested this could go the way of Tiananmen Square, where we're talking not hundreds, but thousands dead. Do you think that's a possibility? It's a possibility. It's a remote one. Uh, the, the army in Ukraine, and I would say generally armies in the post-Soviet sphere, really have a tradition of staying out of uh, partisan politics and a tradition of loyalty to the state, uh, not to the present government. So it's unlikely, even though Yanukovych actually fired uh, the head of the army and replaced him in the last couple of days, that the army would come in and massively crack, not, crack down on protesters. And what it seems to, to be happening so far is the protesters in uh, Kiev now are so well armed that the resistance uh, would be fierce. And, and you could definitely get uh, a bloodbath, but it wouldn't be a case of slaughter of protesters. It would be uh, the start of a civil war. But I gather the replacement is even harder line than the predecessor. So what does that say? Well... Again, it's it's very difficult to to know how uh, he's going to react. Clearly, uh, Yanukovych uh, sacked the previous minister because uh, this guy would not. He has in the past disagreed with Yanukovych, and he could not be relied upon. But uh, with the Ukrainian army, these guys are conscript arm uh, soldiers. These guys are serve close to their homes. I think what you might what you would probably see if they were given this order is not all of them. 
um, would obey it. And you could get an sense the army fighting against itself. Uh, this thing happened recently in uh, Kyrgyzstan uh, in the revolution there in 2010 when the army was moved in and uh, eventually the army just shattered because it couldn't come to any kind of consensus on killing protesters or not. So that would be more likely a scenario. I don't see the army holding together uh, if given the order to launch a massive crackdown. And it would have to be a massive crackdown now because the opposition is so well entrenched in the center of Kiev. Well, well, which raises another question, and I've asked, every time I've asked this of people previously on the program, they've always said, no, that's not an option. But, you know, when you consider that the West thinks one way and the eastern part of the country thinks another way, do you see as an option at all partitioning this country in a kind of an, you know, old-fashioned East Germany, West Germany style of thing? Well, historically, the West and the East have had different trajectories, and the West has been part of the, the Habsburg Empire when the East was part of the Tsarist Empire. Uh, certainly, they have uh, disagreed on many things, and the, the East is more Russian-speaking, the West is a bit more Ukrainian. They're, the populations are mixed. Um, I wouldn't exclude that scenario entirely, mainly because uh, at this point uh, the, the alternatives, as we've just talked about, are so dark. Um, the question is what happens with Kiev. Uh, you almost see this in kind of a Belgium case where there's been this, this sense there that there could be some kind of divide between the French and the Flemish, but then what do you do with Brussels? Mm. Um, the capital is such a prize, and where would that go? Uh, I, I could see a federalization of Ukraine. Uh, the partition would really require also international recognition of both sides, and it's very hard to see a scenario where both the West and Russia agree on whatever solution is presented. And I think that'll be the real key. Let me get your view as well on something that emerged late in the afternoon today, which was the announcement out of Prime Minister Stephen Harper's office that he was going to impose sanctions, admittedly not particularly far-reaching, some travel restrictions on senior government officials in Ukraine coming to Canada. But those sanctions, at least and possibly more beyond that in terms of economic sanctions, what's your view on how effective they can be? Well, I don't think in the Canadian case they're going to be partic particularly effective. Uh, sanctions, uh, if they are to be effective, and the, the sanctions that you've just talked about, Harper, using mimic the ones in the EU, it could be that if the European Union is imposing things like travel bans, things like asset freezes, for example, on some of these oligarchs, that that might accelerate a process of, of crumbling of Yanukovych's power. Uh, but the, the other problem here, both in terms of Canada and the EU, is that there's no, there's no country right now that really can act as an honest broker to try and bring these sides together because of this polarization. Mm -hmm. And you've seen a repeat of that in the last couple of days with both the West uh, and Russia uh, condemning the other side. Um, and there's no sense of, of coming together in the international community. And I think from the beginning, that's been one of the issues that's made it very difficult for, for Ukraine and that both the EU and Russia has really imposed an either-or, take-it-or-leave-it economic solution in a country that's deeply divided. And uh, they've been uh, tra trapped between the two, and this has been a, a very bloody result. Uh, in our last minute here, and I really don't mean this question to sound as cynical as I fear it might, but we do have a, a million Ukrainian Canadians in this country. And, I mean, we saw a fairly unusual thing earlier today where uh, all three parties in the Ontario legislature had their leaders stand up and decry the situation in Ukraine. This is a foreign affairs situation that a provincial government felt a need to speak about. Uh, do you wonder ever whether Canada's interest in this is as genuine as people would like it to be or whether there's a lot more local politics at play here? Well, local politics, I think, drives Canadian foreign policy increasingly. And with this government, uh, it's been pretty clear that uh, with the trip to Israel happening just before the, uh, the Thornhill by-election and these kinds of things, that there's always a meshing between domestic and foreign politics. The Ukrainian lobby is, is, is very powerful. The Ukrainian population is very large. So a certain amount of grandstanding that's going on, I think. And, and again, I, I don't think it's going to make much difference one way or the other in terms of the situation in Ukraine. But uh, it would be nice to have a country that would be acting more as an honest broker than trying to make uh, political capital out of this issue. That's Jeff Sahadeo. He's the director of the Institute of European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at Carleton University. Jeff, good to have you on the program tonight. Thanks so much for uh, helping us out with your analysis tonight. Thank you very much. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.